What's up, everybody? I'm John Middlecoff. You know what I need you to do? Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We got content for days reacting to every NFL game all the time, every single day. Subscribe, like the videos. Let's go. What is going on, everybody? Happy week eight. Uh, we got Thursday night football, the Vikings, Kevin O'Connell taking on his boy, Sean McVay. But today is really about the trade market and the Chiefs. Honestly, as of recording this, I don't even know if it's technically official yet. Maybe it is. Earlier this morning, Andy Reid was asked about trading for DeAndre Hopkins and says, I don't know anything. <laughs> so uh, obviously... He said that because you're not allowed to comment till something's official about other teams' players, and he does know, but DeAndre Hopkins will be a chief. So we, we'll just dive into, I, I just want to talk about big picture, about trading in the NFL and how it's completely changed for the better in season, uh, because it was something that really lacked, I would say, most of my life that was not true in baseball and basketball, where you saw a lot of in-season trades with big names, and I, I think now we're getting that. And could there be a couple other big names being traded? And Andy Dalton, uh, who was in the car accident, I think t was a Tuesday, uh, will not play this week. And Bryce Young will now start. And we'll hit on a couple other NFL stories uh, that are just flying around out there. Robert Sala has resurrected from uh, from his firing and was in Green Bay today. So that, that's his guy. I think him and LaFleur are very, very close. I think they're both. Pretty sure one of them was the best man in the other guy's wedding. Uh, maybe it was LaFleur, the best man in Salah's, and Salah, not the best man in his wedding because LaFleur obviously has brothers. But uh, yeah, so we will dive into some NFL topics. If you missed it, talked to Josh Pate yesterday about college football. So go check that interview out. But obviously before we talk about football, if you want to go to a football game, I was talking to a buddy today at the gym. He's like, uh, you know where I was the other week? I said, where? He said, I went to the LSU Ole Miss game. He's like, it was the craziest environment I've ever seen. He said, it was awesome. And a lot of you guys have hit me up and talked about going to an LSU night game. He said it was bananas. The one difficult thing is when you have 100,000 people at a game, it is difficult to get out. It takes hours. But being there is pretty priceless when you factor in the environment. If you want to go to one of these college football games, if you want to go to college football playoffs, obviously the NFL games, the NBA is off and running, and uh, the World Series, you name it. Concerts. I, I was watching someone today, oh, uh, Lucas Glover. It was some golf content I follow. Said he went to a Taylor Swift concert with his daughter, who's 16, and said, listen, I, I've, I'm a rock country guy, but the concert was pretty incredible. She played uh, and sang for over three hours in the rain. So if you, if you have a young daughter, uh, if your wife's a fan, girlfriend, and you want to go to one of those, we got you covered because the official ticketing app of this podcast can help you take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code JOHN for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, J-O-H-N, for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price is guaranteed. <laughs> You know, for a long, I mean, basically most of my life, you did not have big name players being traded in football. It happened all the time in baseball. I mean, the trade deadline back when baseball was a really big thing nationally was an enormous story. Obviously, in the NBA, you have had huge, huge superstars traded in the middle of the season throughout the history of the league. And in football, when you think about big trades, they happen they usually happen before the season. They tend to happen right right after the NFL combine and during free agency or right before the draft. Occasionally, they happen during training camp. But it's been very rare through the last, I would say, 25 years that big-name guys, like we've seen just in the last week, get traded in season. Typically, the Aaron Rodgers, the Khalil Max, I mean, you name it, get traded outside of the course of the season. That's completely changed. And this is one element of the NFL that is a curveball and is a complete positive because I, I think there are a lot of factors here. 
right? We clearly have a lot of younger, more dynamic GMs. And a lot of these GMs are friends with basketball and baseball GMs. I remember a couple of years ago at the Combine talking with Howie on a podcast and like one of his close buddies is Brian Cashman. Like Brett Veach talks to other GMs in other sports. These guys are all well-connected. And it's not like I would imagine in the 90s or the 2000s, some of these GMs didn't want to make trades. But I do think the economics of the league, because there's a reason coaches consistently get fired more often now, that paying someone 10, 20, 30 million dollars, their entire staff to go away is a line item now for these NFL owners. It's an extra decimal point that they don't even notice. Well, in the in the 90s, a lot of coaches probably got more years than the ownership wanted to give them because they didn't want to pay them to go away. And I think with NFL contracts, it was the same thing. Like NFL contracts are not structured like baseball or basketball. So a big reason that these players and these other sports got traded, if I sign you to a $100 million deal or $50 million deal, money's all relative, right? So the 80s, 90s, whatever the contract number was, it's kind of a pay as you go. Now, the contract might be fully guaranteed, but if you have 20, 30, 50 million dollars remaining on your contract, you have to be on my team for me to pay that. That's why when you see in the NBA, they just trade this guy. Well, I don't know that guy any more money. Where in the NFL, it's completely different because money's not guaranteed and a lot of you know higher price guys get big signing bonuses. So if I sign you to a $50 million contract, well, I'm, I'm probably historically less inclined to trade you after a, one year if it's not working out because of that $50 million, I gave you $28 million guaranteed. Real cash. And if I guaranteed $40 million of the contract, I had to put that away in escrow. So owners were like, well, th- this isn't a pay-as-you-go situation. It's much more complicated. And I think nowadays, with the explosion of the cap, with the explosion of the television money, they're like, yeah, I, I know we gave him a big bonus, but whatever, screw it. it. Our coach doesn't want him. He doesn't fit here. We can get some draft capital. Send him packing. I mean, we just had a recent example last year when they cut Russell Wilson. Think how much money the Walton family gave him immediately when he signed that contract. Well, they're worth billions upon billions upon billions of dollars. So yeah, I gave him $80 million or $100 million or whatever the, I I didn't look up the number before I went on this rant. Probably should have. But my point is, they don't care. Where historically, no one would ever do that because most of these owners weren't flush with cash like they are now. And they didn't have the windfall of cash consistently coming in from television. So you have the perfect combination of all these variables. The owners have never had more money. And when you win in the NFL, I'm not even talking the Super Bowl. I'm just saying when you are consistently good, your franchise and you personally make way more money. So you are way more inclined to be aggressive and do whatever it takes to get a good team as quickly as possible. And if that means getting rid of a big salary, if you're losing to gain more draft picks in the hope of you can flip those draft picks into good players for cheaper... Like, it makes sense. And if you're the Buffalo Bills, if you're Brett Veach, obviously the, the Jets are somewhat of a unique circumstance, but the one team in the NFL I worked for was the Philadelphia Eagles, who, you know, were kind of ahead of their time because Howie is probably the most aggressive GM. And Andy, because he's such a good coach, has never been afraid of being aggressive with personnel acquisitions. Now, historically, a lot of them have happened in the offseason, But you just saw, boom, we need a wide receiver trade for DeAndre Hopkins. The owner, yeah, we'll do it. Let's do it. Here's a pick, right? And and we'll get into that specific trade here in a second. But I think we all win because the NFL, listen, is it perfect right now if you've been watching the league for a long time? No. It it feels, and I I hate saying this, but like super soft, but it kind of does because some of these hits are constantly flagged. You're like, this is egregious. But that's not going to change. So we can keep complaining about that all we want. The amount of flags in some of these games, it does feel like the conspiracy theorists that come out and say they want more flags because longer games need more ad times for the television networks. Like, I don't think that's true, but wouldn't be the craziest thing that these networks are paying so much money. But regardless, like the flags, uh, specifically the hitting and the 
the lack of defenders having any chance to have success does feel kind of crazy at times. But overall, I, I think this element of some player acquisition and player movement, like this isn't the NBA where guys just constantly demand to get traded and get their wishes. Cause you see a lot of guys make demands and it doesn't get met. It to me still is the management. I would say has the slight upper hand, uh, but I, I would say that is slowly and slowly changed over the, I would say uh, explosion of contracts and clearly the importance of the quarterback position. Like you, you can argue all you want. Like the jets, just do everything Aaron Rodgers says, but like, what are they supposed to do? Not listen to him? <laughs> like they're kind of desperate. It all hinges on the, you know, his right arm. And I, I think there has been a huge, huge growth of younger guys that don't care and want to be aggressive, become general managers. And a lot of younger coaches as well that are more like, yeah, we'll figure it out. Get them here and, and we'll make it happen. I mean, McVay, they're pretty famous for making a lot of trades. Why? Because, like, well, I'm the boss. We'll make this fit, right? And I just think that used to not happen because it's so hard to get a guy, change the scheme midseason. He's not going to know what's going on. And personnel people are like, like, we can't just trade for a corner. <laughs> like, you, you can't just tell them, hey, on this play, play zone, on this play, play man. I mean, I know it's more complicated than that, but it's not as complicated, I think, as some coaches make it. And now I think there's just kind of an agreement between the owners, the general managers, the coaching staffs that like, yeah, we can trade for, you know, impact starters in the middle of the season and it's worth it. And we all benefit because it's really, really fun. I mean, we just had Amari Cooper, DeAndre Hopkins, and Devontae Adams traded in the last, what, less than 10 days? So that's cool. <laughs> I'm not actually eight because they were both traded on Tuesday morning. And then DeAndre Hopkins traded on Wednesday morning. So uh, a week later, I'm glad it happened. And specifically on the Chiefs, I, I looked at some numbers today. You know, the Chiefs offensively are actually the fourth best third down, third down offense. I think it's only Baltimore, Detroit, and Tampa. Now, probably going to change with Tampa with the injuries they've had. But I think when we think and talk about the Chiefs, we go, their offense has been terrible. Well, scoring-wise, they have not scored as many points as you would think a team led by Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes would score. But they have been efficient on third down, which is obviously the most important down. And I think there's been talk like Andy Reid doesn't go forward as much on fourth down as some of these other coaches. Well, he's probably in less fourth down situations than a lot of other than some of these teams that are constantly there because they're not as efficient on third down. One number jumped out to me, though, when looking at the Chiefs offense. They are closer to 20 than they are to 10 when it comes to first down pass attempts, which kind of makes sense, right? They don't have full faith in their receiving core. Uh, I would say Andy has been more inclined to run the ball these last couple of years with the emergence of Pacheco, but then he shatters his leg. In watching him against the 49ers, like they like Worthy a lot, but he's still a rookie. And he's, I don't want to say he's a one trick pony, but he's got a specific role. They try to get on big explosive plays. You wouldn't exactly call him a possession wide receiver. Well, they kind of had a version of that until Patrick Mahomes threw an interception and then took him out in Rasheed Rice. And Travis, who they clearly, clearly all they care about with him is the playoff run. So they kind of like, they're not rushing to just force feed him 10, 12 targets a game. I do think that could change down the stretch as they are trying to solidify the number one seed and obviously in playoff games. But in October and November, like they're just not treating him like they used to. And Patrick doesn't either. Like he will throw to other guys. So to me, getting DeAndre Hopkins, who is the ultimate possession wide receiver, like he can't run, but he's never been able to run. He's one of the great contested catch guys, not just of his generation. I would say the last like 25 years, you just throw it up in his vicinity and he tends to make a lot of plays. And I, I don't even count his, like, whatever his numbers are this year are relevant to me. Look at last year when he was on the field, played in all the games, he got 75 passes with an anemic quarterback situation. So you get a guy who can give you 75 to 80 catches. He's not in the prime of his career anymore, but he's a guy that Patrick on first down, like, can throw the ball to. And I think it balances out their offense a little bit. 
Now, they didn't just trade for, you know, some Hall of Famer in his prime. But they did get a credible pro who his game translates to colder weather because he's not a speed demon. And I I think it's a pretty good fit. And the other thing was they didn't give up very much. They gave up a fifth round pick that for it to kick into a fourth round pick, they have to make the Super Bowl and he has to play 60% of the snaps. So if you make the Super Bowl again, they will gladly give up a fourth round pick. Worst case scenario, they lose in the AFC Championship. Okay, gave up a fifth round pick to dramatically help our offense and increase our chances of winning playoff games and continuing to win and, and maybe increase our margin for error in these regular season games because their margin for error so far in these regular season games has not been very big. So I, I'm glad these trades like Amari Cooper to the Bills, DeAndre Hopkins. The NBA is finally back. A new season means new ways to get into the action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Who's draining threes from beyond the arc? Who's hit the boards, getting rebounds? Get behind your favorite players on prop bets you can make on DraftKings the home of NBA player props. Ready to place your first bet? Try betting something simple, like picking a team to win. Go to DraftKings Sportsbook app and place your bet. First time, new DraftKings customers bet five bucks to win 200 in bonus bets instantly. Take it to the rack with DraftKings Sportsbook. Every point counts. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use the code JOHN. That's code John for new customers to get 200 in bonus bets when you bet just five bucks. Only on DraftKings, the crown is yours. I looked at a couple other names. I read this article today on The Athletic about the Cleveland Browns. Two things jumped out. One, the writer wrote that, you know, because Jameis is starting this week, and he basically wrote that Thompson Robinson and Jameis were easily the best two quarterbacks in training camp. Think how crazy that is. You have a 200, obviously he's, Injured now, and probably, who knows? We ever see him again playing for the Cleveland Browns? But you have a two hundred thirty million dollar quarterback, and he's not even remotely close to your best quarterback in camp. So the guy we saw throughout the season, we shouldn't be that shocked because he's not even the best quarterback on their own team, which we saw last year when Joe Flacco came was dramatically better. But I do think when you have an asset and you are going nowhere, and your quarterback situation is a disaster. I think the more options you have, you have to entertain. And I think with the Raiders and the Browns, they have the two most powerful assets if they wanted to sell. And you, you probably could include the Titans with Jeffrey Simmons. I'd be lying if I said I've watched a lot of Titans. I, I'm not, I don't know how Simmons is playing, but if he's healthy, he would have a lot of value as well. You're not talking about a guy that you could just trade midseason for a first-round pick. If you were willing, we've talked a lot about Crosby, right? I, I think they could probably get two ones for him. I also think Miles Garrett is 28 years old, but I, I think you'd get two ones. I, you know, to me, the minimum you would get would be like a one, a two, and next year's two. So I, I think you've got to entertain these calls because the one thing we know is these GMs are willing to play ball. All these GMs who feel like we're close, we can win the Super Bowl this year, we're right there. Because you would go, well, you would never trade a guy like that in your division. But what if the Ravens offered you two first-round picks for Miles Garrett? Like, your team is going nowhere, and there's no end in sight. Hell, Kevin Stefanski, who is an excellent play caller, is just like, yeah, I'm just going to let Ken Dorsey do it. This season's such a joke, such a disaster here. Like, that, that's how's it going to change next year? Like, you're not making the playoffs with DTR or Jameis Winston. So I, I just think that you have to entertain. These calls are being made, and these meetings are happening. And I do think you have to get to a point where, is there a price where we would pull the trigger? Is there a price? Right? Like, obviously, the good teams, there is no price you could pay to, like, trade for Chris Jones. Because Chiefs want to win the Super Bowl this year, even if it's like, hey, we give you three first-rounders. Well, yeah, that's quote-unquote an overpay, but his value to the Chiefs is so important and all they care about right now is winning the Super Bowl. But you get these terrible teams with the second most important position, arguably, the pass rusher, and they're elite players, and your franchise is circling the drain. I'm not saying it's an easy decision. I'm not saying it's a no-brainer, 
But I, I think once we get in the two first rounder conversations with guys that are closer to 30 than they are 25, like we got to think long and hard about this, especially because we got to change the quarterback position. And it doesn't necessarily have to be this year. Like if you end up not drafting one and you think only Shador Sanders is worth the number one overall pick, start building the team. But then the following year, you also got two first rounders and you got some ammo. It gives you optionality. And I'm not one for tanking. I, I, I think it's that's been a huge reason the NBA ratings have tanked. Load management and tanking. The NFL does not have that, right? The reason if Jaden Daniels doesn't play this week is not because they're giving him a rest. It's because he's hurt. The only time a guy doesn't play in the NFL is in, he's injured. And we all acknowledge it. It's like, yeah, the guy couldn't play. Because if he could, most of them play injured. Let, let alone like, or attempt to. They, they usually work out before the game and beg to play. And sometimes the doctors say no. But I, I, I'd have to think long and hard about those two players if I can get two first rounders. And I, I would imagine uh, these young GMs that are kind of gunslingers and willing, which I appreciate. Like, I'm a gambler. Uh, I've gambled my entire life. I, I'm not even just talking about like on sports. I'm just talking on life. I, 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 I'm inclined to take more risks, I would say, than most people. I kind of like it. That's the one area in my life to kind of get my juices flowing. I, I would never, but I would also never go skydiving, right? I, I would never go uh, cage diving for sharks. Like that, that's not what gets my blood fucking moving. I, I would rather just like not work in this industry, start my own shit and see what I could do. <laughs> Right. I, I, I like taking risks. And I, I think historically, a lot of GMs in the other sports have been willing to and swing for the fences. And in the NFL, once the season started, it felt like they were very risk adverse. And now it feels the opposite. So these are two type players that I, I do think you could get a boatload and completely change the future of your franchise. Now, it also comes down to like I saw Cleo Mack was traded for a couple first round picks and they pick back players. Like once you make the trade, it is on you to pick the right players or utilize those picks in trades or whatever to accumulate the right talent. So it's not like only 50% of your work is done, but man, I, I, I would be inclined to, uh, to let it fly. Other story today, Andy Dalton was in a car accident and I saw Canales said that he, he sprained or hurt his thumb. So he obviously, I, I the, the headline I saw, I would imagine you can't grip a ball, uh, but all things considered better just hurting your thumb than something serious happening in a car accident. So looks like he avoided disaster, but that means Bryce Young is going to start. And listen, I'm not acting like uh, playing Monday morning quarterback here. I love Bryce Young in college. I would have taken him number one overall. So by no means am I calling them dumb for drafting him over CJ Stroud. I, I would have done the same thing. I, I would have. Now that aged poorly immediately, and it got even worse this year because he was unplayable. He he looked like a USFL quarterback, which is insane because watching him in college, his instincts, his ability to manipulate the pocket, I, I just thought a lot of things would translate. And it turns out one thing I underestimated is, God damn, he looks small. He just feels like one of the smallest players in the history of the NFL. Definitely at that position. So I think he has two options now. And I think one of them can get really dire. But let's start with the positive one. He can change the course of his career. If he comes back and just looks solid and wins a couple games, one, he can help them avoid getting the number one overall pick and drafting a quarterback. And two, he can just at least validate, okay, we took a step back. It's like going on timeout, you know, when you're a kid or getting grounded. It's supposed to, like, give you a reset. You're supposed to go away for a minute, go on go on timeout, get suspended if you get in a little trouble at school, come back, new guy. Sorry, uh, I'll wear it. It was on me. Change man here. Change kid, which rarely happens. It's like, it's like a, I'm a big mob movie guy. So I follow so much mob stuff, like, on Instagram. It's, it's a tried and true formula. Dude gets in trouble, goes to jail, comes out a couple years later. He's like, change man. And like three minutes later, he's back wheeling and dealing with his boys. And then he gets arrested again. But he really has two options. It's either play well 
and changed the discourse about them, which has been 100% fair. Again, they benched him for a reason. He was unplayable. Or you kind of become Trey Lance. Like, Trey Lance is a third quarterback. He can't win backup jobs. And I think if Bryce Young continues to look like he did before he was benched for Andy Dalton, I think that's what you're looking at. You're looking at a third stringer. So this guy, within a couple years, can go from the number one pick, starting quarterback, to he couldn't be any worse. He's a he, he's a guy that we bring to camp, if he's traded or cut, to compete for our backup job. And right now, if he were to look like he looked earlier in the season, you could not make him your backup quarterback. Because as we see all over the NFL, all it takes is one ankle sprain, one sprained shoulder, one broken finger and you can't grip a ball and your backup's playing not just in that game but he might have to start several games and if he's the type player and he keeps proving what he's been in the NFL I can't even compete with like he he couldn't complete wheel routes and out routes like to, to even have a chance in the NFL as just to make a roster at quarterback obviously you got to know the playbook you got to be a smart guy and you got to be tough but like from a playing standpoint I don't need my backup to be super dynamic, to to hit go routes and post routes and run around. But I do need you, if I have to start you for a short period of time, to be able to hit basic passes, an out route on third and seven, a a wheel route on second and eight, a a slant route that's open against a specific coverage that we consistently call. Right? I I understand that the big play potential, if I have a good starter, is going to drop dramatically. No shit. He's the backup quarterback. But I do have to be able to function as an offense to hopefully my defense carries us, we run the ball, and ideally you you attempt less than 25 passes on the games you have to start. But I need you to complete 15 to 18 of them. And you watch Bryce Young, you're like, this isn't even close. So I, I'm fascinated to watch this play out. Uh, I, I changed my opinion on him really, really fast because of his size. And l- listen, Kyler's tiny. But you watch Kyler, you go, well, he's the fastest guy on the field. His arm strength looks like fucking Mahomes. <laughs> you know, like his really only knock because he's short. But he makes up for it with all these elite athletic traits. And you watch Bryce, you go, well, he's not very fast. His arm looks terrible. Uh, he's not very accurate. It's like he doesn't really bring anything to the table tangibly maybe he's a good guy maybe he knows the offense and you like him in the meeting room but like all that stuff's great but if you're gonna play like you got to bring some tangible stuff to the field to the field so this is a big moment for him because to me if he plays well and just shows something and, and this is a tough spot too like he's going on the road to denver who is not a great team but their defense is really good and they're coming off somewhat of a mini buy because they played on Thursday. So can he go on the road in an environment? I mean, this is probably one of the more optimistic Denver seasons. It feels like in years, right? Their fans think like, why can't we win nine, 10 games and get a wild card spot? Even if we're out in the first round, what an improvement that is from the last several years. So this is going to be tough. It could either unravel fast or you could earn like, oh, shit, he, this guy's, that, that served him well. And if I was a betting man, I would bet it's not going to go well. But, and I probably, I plan on betting against them, even though it's a massive line, just because from what I've seen, it's been horrendous. Uh, Let's bang out a couple other quick things. Shanahan says that McCaffrey, not going to play this week, should uh, or potentially could practice next week. I do believe this is one of the more mysterious injuries we've ever seen. Because clearly it's more than just like Achilles soreness. Obviously it was in both Achilles. But to go to almost Halloween, I guess by the time they play next week, will be after Halloween. And we haven't seen Christian McCaffrey. Uh, Not what I expected. Honestly, I was pretty bullish in training camp. I'm like, they're just holding him out. Kyle keeps saying he could play if they had to. And then by the time the regular season came, it got worse. So this is one of the big, I would say, X factors in the NFL that if he can come back and just be normal, I mean, if you talk about the trade deadlines, like adding Christian McCaffrey, 
but it's hard to be optimistic when I've seen so many players. I mean, we all have that have Achilles soreness that have Achilles soreness and then the thing rips. So it's just something to, something to keep an eye on whenever he does come back. Like, is he completely fine? And then to me, the big test would be if he does play in a game and does look good, what's the next day? Like, can he walk? Is the soreness gone? Is he just back to normal? So the other thing that <laughs> McCarthy was asked about Jerry, uh, talking shit about his play calling and bad designs, and Mike was like, yeah, I guess we'll just have to go back and look. I mean, it's just, it's difficult. It, it's We talked about it yesterday. And I heard Albert Breer with Colin today that he thinks Jerry takes a lot of shit for just kind of willy-nilly saying this stuff. And he thinks some of this is like sly like a fox old guy, you know, holding out on CD and Dak, trying to light a fire under them, saying all this stuff about Mike, trying to light a fire under them. And, and I do uh, agree that that's possibility, that, that he's trying to kind of play some motivational tactics. I don't quite know what like saying your play calling sucks does to really motivate anybody. Cause I do think it's fair to assume that Mike McCarthy so far this season has been doing the best of his ability to get guys open and scheme plays. Like, I don't think he's tried any less hard on a Wednesday or a Tuesday designing the game plan Monday, breaking down film with his offensive staff than he would have two years ago with years remaining on his contract when he had winning records. Like, I, I, I don't know, like, I don't know. I don't know what good that serves the totality of the operation beside like, yeah, listen, I'm, there's heat on my feet here. Like I'm walking on, uh, you know, on hot coals because I don't have a contract. Like if that's not motivation enough, like clearly you got the wrong guy. And that's kind of what it's feeling like that if this continues and they lose, that it's just a foregone conclusion that Mike McCarthy will not be the coach of the Dallas Cowboys anymore. Robert Sala was in Green Bay today, and LaFleur was asked about it and said that he will work with the offense. You know, be like the de- – sometimes coaches do this. I remember when when I first got into radio, Harbaugh did this with Eric Mangini. He had Eric Mangini as like on the offensive side of the ball working like a defensive guy, helping the offense, what to see. Coaches kind of love doing that shit. But ultimately, I I think it's just a really good friend taking care of his guy. And I would expect Robert Sala, I think it's still owed money next year. If he does want to coach, he will be on the Packers staff. And if this Packer team continues to do well, and Jeff Halfley gets a job as a young defensive coordinator, he's been a head coach at Boston College, that Robert Sala would be his next defensive coordinator. Uh, Last but not least, Alvin Kamara. (laughs) Every once in a while, it's like, Saints are in shambles. You know, and they were my team to win the division, which clearly isn't going to happen. And then you're just like, God, this is a season from hell. And then all of a sudden you look and it's like, oh, we've signed uh, Alvin Kamara, who looks awesome, by the way, to a two-year, $25 million contract extension. You're like, that's kind of random. Now, I think ultimately he's a guy that you want on your team that is a winning player who's, you know, one of the best running backs in the NFL. And when you do this stuff for a team that's, you know, historically in cap hell, in a weird way, it actually lightens your cap because you're able to keep pushing money back. So I would imagine this is the type move where you go, listen, I want Alvin Kamara on my team next year. We give him this contract extension. It actually frees up space for us in the offseason. But... I, I didn't see uh, October 23rd with the Saints, several games under 500, starting Spencer Rattler, no hope in sight. Yeah, contract extension. Here you go, Alvin. But, hey, it's New Orleans for you. 